Welcome to the Conference Center and Global Specs Plant and Facilities Engineering Online Event. Cyber threats to industrial facilities are increasing in frequency, sophistication, and severity. Merely isolating your plant's control network is not enough. USB keys, corrupted patches, project files transmitted in emails, poorly secured laptops, or infected PDF user manuals all represent paths into an industrial site. Before introducing our speaker, we'd like to invite you to submit questions at any point during this presentation by using the Enter Question and Submit area at the base of this video console. Also, some of the presentations you will see today include detailed information, so we would encourage you to click the Download PPT button so that you can follow along with your own copy of the PowerPoint slides. As Chief Technology Officer of Buyer Security, Eric Byers is actively involved with the design and implementation of industrial cybersecurity systems worldwide. Eric, thank you for joining us today. Hi, I'm Eric Byers. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Tofino Security. And I'm going to be talking today about the worm called Stuxnet and how it's changed the world for industrial control systems. If you're an engineer who's involved in control systems, uh, in any way, design or operations, if you're a control systems professional, technician, this is something you need to be aware of. Now you may never have heard of Stuxnet and you may not uh, know much about it, so I'll start by talking a little bit about what this worm is. It was discovered in July 2010 and it was not a normal worm and then it wasn't attacking websites or computers. It was attacking control systems, specifically the Siemens uh, PCS7 uh, control system line, the uh, um, PLC S7, and their HMI products. And it was designed specifically to go after those, making it a very unusual worm. It infected about 100,000 computers around the world uh, and at least 22 manufacturing sites, probably close to several hundred is more accurate. Uh, and what we do know about it is that it appears to be designed to go after and destroy the uranium enrichment facilities in the tons, which is Iran's uh, enrichment uh, facility for making nuclear weapons. Um, it was the very first worm we've ever seen that was designed to um, affect uh, a process and actually destroy it and destroy equipment. So it was very, very unusual. Now, I was very interested in this worm for uh, a number of reasons, um, but the one that really caught my attention was, wait a second, isn't a nuclear site like this that's making nuclear weapons very heavily air-gapped, highly secure? One would think so, wouldn't you? And yet, uh, if that's the case, if Stuxnet could get in there, what about all the rest of the facilities in the world? And what about not this version of Stuxnet, but maybe uh, other versions that are modified by other people to build the son of Stuxnet? Could that infect our control systems? And how would it get in? Because we need to know that if we're running control systems. Now, there's a very trivial scenario that uh, everybody uh, talks about because Stuxnet was famous for its ability to be spread on USB keys. You put a USB key, uh, with Stuxnet on it into your drive, you don't have to have auto start on, you don't have to click on anything, it would automatically infect your computer. So it's very unusual and, and that caught a lot of attention. And so people thought of Stuxnet, uh, they often think of, well, maybe Joe, the engineer, picked up a USB key in the parking lot and walked in and plugged it into the control system uh, computers and infected uh, the towns. But I think that's a really trivial solution or trivial uh, way of looking at it. Um, and it results in really trivial solutions like, well, let's just ban USB keys. It turns out that Stuxnet was far more complex and far more nuanced than that. And we really have to understand what Stuxnet is if we're going to try and stop it from infecting us. Now, to do that, we performed a gap analysis. Um, what we did is we uh, tried to understand all the routes something like Stuxnet would take to be able to infect a control system. And we started off with the premise that a nuclear site would follow every recommendation a vendor had. That might be a little optimistic, but we'll assume that they're um, applying perfect security. And from there, we, in our lab and in our office, we uh, then watched Stuxnet spread in such an environment. And we did um, tests to see if we could understand the pathways it would take in and how it would move. 
And by using this information, we are hoping to be able to learn how to stop the next Stuxnet from infecting your plant. So to understand Stuxnet, you need to understand a little bit about uh, the Siemens product line. And the first thing uh, you should know is that they have what they call the AS or automation system. And that's the actual PLCs, the, um, what they call the S7 PLC. Then there's what we call the uh, OS, not operating system, but operator station. Uh, or operator system, and those are the HMIs. Those are what the uh, operators and engineers view the process with and control the process. And finally, the last component that's critical in Siemens systems is the ES, uh, the engineering system. And these are basically your programming consoles and your management consoles. Now, all this is put together in what Siemens calls their high security architecture for uh, high risk sites. Uh, and uh, you can see that it's actually an architecture that divides the plant into a number of zones, um, starting with what they call the enterprise area and working right down to the control systems. But there's a few things that are worth pointing out about this. First of all, there's lots of firewalls here, but they're all configured identically. And so uh, if the worm can get through one of them, it can get through them all, and that's a serious mistake. Uh, secondly, uh, there's no firewall between the last line of uh, PCs, the operator stations, um, and what they call the PCN. This is the actual uh, network with the PLC controllers on it. And so that if for some reason one of those uh, computers uh, down on that um, uh, control system network on HMI or something that gets infected by some means, it immediately can access the controllers and make changes to the controllers. And so this is another area that we see as a, a significant security risk. Okay. Now, how would Stuxnet infect a site like this? Well, it actually would go through a series of stages, seven stages to be precise. It would start off by having to penetrate the facility or the company where it needs to attack. Uh, it could come in on a USB key. It come in a number of ways. We'll talk about more about that in a moment. But once it's inside, it needs to infect at least one computer. Uh, then it would need to move because it probably had, wouldn't infect the right computer. It would probably not be, maybe it was a secretary's computer. Uh, maybe it was a, a draftsman's computer. Who knows who it infected first, but it would have to start to propagate. And so the next phase is the propagation phase. And while that propagation phase is going on, it has to resist detection. And so it has to use a lot of detection avoidance mechanisms. Finally, it starts to identify the right target, the PLCs that it wants to make changes to to actually destroy the process. Uh, and when it, starts, when it finds the right PLC, it starts to make the modifications. And then, and then by making those modifications and waiting for a specific trigger signal, it actually destroys the equipment. In this case, it changed the frequencies uh, running on the centrifuges in the towns to speed them up far beyond their design speed, slow them down abruptly, speed them up until the centrifuges would effectively wear themselves out in short order. Now let's talk about some of these stages. Um, let's talk about the penetration stage. How does it get into this company? Uh, we actually know that um, these handoffs or penetrations were very focused. Uh, they ran between June 2009 and May 2010. They stopped after the worm was discovered. So they were going on for uh, over a year before uh, anybody knew about them. There was 10 attempts, and they were made to five very specific organizations in Iran. And what you can see from this diagram of one particular infection is one infection of a computer would then spread very, very widely in the company. Uh, moving out to uh, hundreds of computers and working its way deeper and deeper into the control system. Uh, how would it get into that company uh, initially? Well, there's many, many possibilities. Obviously, there's a possibility of the USB key. But it turns out that Stuxnet was a really multi-talented Swiss Army knife of a worm. Uh, it could uh, take uh, infected project files, the actual uh, PLC logic um, and infect the logic itself so that if a contractor brought in new logic for the control system, uh, just brought it in on, say, a CD, uh, that would actually contain the worm and spread.
Um, it could be sent in with what we call a dropper email, an email that contains uh, what looks like a safe attachment, but when you execute it, it launches itself and builds the worm on your computer and then proceeds to spread in the form we know now. Uh, it could be a laptop. Maybe an employee's laptop was off-site at a contractor at a trade show and was uh, infected when he wasn't looking. There's many, many uh, possibilities for an attacker to be able to infect the site. Now, once it got in, then it would spread. It had many propagation methods, seven or eight at least. Uh, some of them it would continue to use things like the USB flash drive. But it would do other things like, for example, send itself uh, as a print job to a print server and infect that print server. Um, it would infect um, project files. It would infect um, SQL connections. Uh, the number of ways it would spread was um, scary and um, truly amazing. So once it started spreading, how did it get through the firewalls? This is one of the things that's really important to understand. And it turned out there was many ways it could get through those three firewalls in the design. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it would use things like printing itself to a uh, printer as a print job. Uh, and if printing was allowed through the firewall, then Stuxnet was through the firewall. If people had file shares um, crossing the firewall, Stuxnet would get through. Uh, if you had databases that were shared across the firewall, and these are all common things in control systems where perhaps a data historian needs to access files in another area or a uh, user wants to uh, print alarm records outside his area. And, and uh, this information will transfer between, firewall or between zones and across the firewall. So, this is um, something that needs to be concerned or considered. But even more important in the case of Stuxnet is Stuxnet used the actual protocols that underline, uh, underlie Siemens uh, communications, and these protocols are called uh, RPC. They're also used in things like uh, the OPC uh, protocols that are very common. And so what Stuxnet did is it piggybacked on these valid protocols. It would really put any system administrator in a very big quandary. If they decided to shut down these particular protocols in the network, they'd effectively shut down their operation. If they didn't, then Stuxnet could spread uh, um, openly and freely. It would be also highly unlikely that anybody would actually notice them um, because it just looks like normal traffic. So there's an important lesson here is that um, Protocols uh, can be piggybacked by worms, uh, valid protocols that you have to have in your control system. And you need to be able to look deep into the protocols to understand them, not just say, oh yeah, that's an okay protocol. Now, this uh, picture illustrates some of the paths that we were able to determine that Stuxnet would have had to work its way in from outside an organization right down into the control systems. You can see that the green lines indicate the path that we think is most probable. And we describe this in a paper um, that I'll uh, talk about later. And uh, the red lines uh, show the happy path if you're Stuxnet. That's the Joe finds it, the USB key in the parking lot path. It may have spread that way, but we believe the green ones are the more likely. But the real takeaway from this is not the path any particular path, but just the number of paths here. You'll notice that there are so many ways into the control system. Now, Stuxnet's left us with a legacy. Um, first of all, it is a model for future destructive worms, and already we've seen uh, somebody reusing Stuxnet code in a worm called DoQ. Um, but it's not the last of the family. Um, it is uh, so well understood, and it will definitely be copied. Even if they don't copy the exact Stuxnet code, um, what Stuxnet's doing is um, exploiting inherent design flaws in PLCs. The way that PLCs have been designed for the last 20 years, and any control system, uh, allows a worm to be able to run freely on them. Um, it's, so this really applies not just to PLCs, but anything that is an automation device in the industrial world. An RTU, a distributed control system, uh, you name it. And because these are design questions and not vulnerabilities that, like you'd see on Windows, uh, there are no easy patches. So there's a few lessons we can learn from this. Um, first of all, uh, a modern control system is not something that's isolated. There's very, very complex interconnections. As well, um, there's not one pathway from the outside. There's many pathways. 
you can see in the diagrams earlier that there were uh, dozens of ways in. And in fact, um, studies by the US government and the um, uh, um, industrial control system uh, uh, security emergency response teams uh, showed that on average, uh, highly secure mission critical control systems actually have about 11 pathways in when they're inspected. So if you think that you've got an air gap between your control system and the rest of your business, you're probably um, misguided. In fact, there are probably many ways in. They may not be obvious. They won't be uh, a big network connection, or maybe they are, but there'll be all sorts of other pathways in, like the fact that people bring in CDs or laptops or USB keys, the fact that there's serial lines connecting in, the fact that there's remote support lines. All of these are important to be considered. They're all pathways. And if you focus on just one of those pathways, for example, many sites have beaten up USB keys and say, that's it, no more USB keys on the plant, you're really missing the point. You're looking at one messenger and forgetting about the many, many other pathways in. So what are we going to do about this? How are we going to protect against Stuxnet? And not really Stuxnet. That's, it's sort of old and gone, but all its children, as I call them, the son of Stuxnet, the next generation that gets released by somebody else against another target, perhaps your company. So the very first thing we need to think about um, is the pathways into the plant floor. And this is a pretty typical control system um, that you'll see with an office network, a connection from the office network, obviously out into the internet for things like remote support, a plant network that might uh, connect different control systems and um, have uh, systems like data historians and manufacturing execution systems. And then down below that, your actual control network with your uh, HMIs uh, and your PLCs on it. You may have also external networks running out um, to uh, things like remote sites, um, tank farms, etc. Uh, and of course, you probably have a little bit of um, the old infamous RS-232 serial lines as well. All of these things need to be taken into consideration. And the reason is, is they all provide pathways onto the plant floor. Insecure remote support, uh, misconfigured firewalls, uh, infected laptops, wireless, insecure modems, infected USB keys, problems at the remote sites. Uh, even RS-232 serial lines can be a source of infection. So all of these things have to be considered. Now, a way to organize this is set up uh, through a series of, in a series of standards um, called the ISA 99 or ANSI 99 uh, standards. Um, and the core part of this is that a perimeter defense is not enough. We can't just put in one firewall and say we're over because the bad guys will get in just like Stuxnet got in. And as well, some problems just start on the plant floor, and uh, so keeping everything out uh, may not be keeping the right things out. So what we have to do is what we do in a business network. We have to harden uh, the actual devices on the plant floor. Think about your typical uh, business network, or your laptop even on your company's network. It, it doesn't just sit there unprotected because there's a corporate firewall. It has antivirus, it has automatic patching, it has a personal firewall. There's many, many security systems that are actually protecting that. And that's called defense in depth. And that's exactly what we need on a control system. Now, as I mentioned, there's a series of standards that define this, and they're called the ANSI ISA 99 standards, if you're in North America. In Europe and the rest of the world, they're part of the IEC 62443 series of standards. And they define a concept called zones and conduits. And this is a way to formally break down your plant into a level of segmentation and then control the traffic between areas. In other words, the control network is getting broken into zones based on their function, and then this gives you your defense in depth. Let me give you an example. This is an oil refinery, large oil refinery in North America, and uh, in this image you can just see how the, the, the organization has sort of roughly broken down its operations. Uh, there'll be an external connections and there'll be a corporate boundary. Uh, there'll be the enterprise network that the business assets sit on. There'll be what they call the process information network in this particular one that keeps things like data historians. And then there'll be different operational networks. Um, and it could be, for example, in a refining, it could be tank farm, 
cat crackers, etc. I've shown two here to make it simple, but in a real refinery, there'd be more operational networks. So the very first thing that this refinery did is formally uh, define these zones in a document. And you can see these zones here. Each zone is given a name and a particular function and what uh, assets live inside that zone and what needs to be protected. Um, and then the next stage is to figure out the traffic flows. What um, zones are allowed to talk to each other? And this is what we call the conduits. Conduits aren't pieces of pipe. They're not a physical thing. They're um, a logical concept of where am I going to allow traffic to flow between what zones? And so they defined a series of uh, allowed connections, the conduits. And you can see them here with these red dots. Now, once they had defined those, then the next step was to decide how they were going to make sure only that traffic would flow. And in this case, they chose to put in industrial firewalls that were specifically designed for conduit use. Um, and they put regular firewalls, IT firewalls, up high in the IT department. But these other firewalls sit down lower uh, and designed to very narrow, narrowly focus what traffic can get into a zone. So for example, take a look at the zone down in the lower left hand corner. That's your basic control zone and your safety zones. And so they may want a very, very narrow, highly concentrated, very uh, specific flow of traffic to be allowed between the safety areas and the primary control areas. And they want to narrow that down to a very, very specific few messages uh, so that worms and viruses couldn't piggyback in. We'll talk more about that in a second. Now, one of the important things to consider is what we call uh, SCADA appropriate or uh, ICS appropriate technologies. Because what's happening on the plant floor and the protocols we see on the plant floor are not the ones we see in the business world. You may uh, see things like email and web traffic in the business world, but hopefully you don't have that going on your plant floor. So firewalls or VPN solutions that are optimized for web traffic and emails really don't do the job you need on the plant floor. So it's really important to have ICS appropriate technologies that can detect when things go wrong on the plant floor and block them. So you want to look beyond the traditional firewall towards what we call deep packet inspection firewalls. These are firewalls that can look deep into a protocol such as Modbus or Ethernet IP and tear it apart and say, oh, you know, that's not a valid Ethernet message or that's not a, a, an allowed command. Maybe you're not allowed to write a command or write data from one area to another. Maybe you're not allowed to program from one area to another. Those are the type of things you want to actually inspect in your firewall. Again, this is called deep packet inspection. I'll give you one example, um, and this is uh, actually used in this site, and this oil company needed a firewall to protect those control systems, uh, the safety systems I mentioned earlier. Now what they wanted is something very, very simple. They didn't want to have to configure it every time. They knew exactly what traffic uh, flowed between um, the safety system and the business system, or sorry, the safety system and the control system. Um, and they knew what they wanted to flow and what they didn't. And so they worked with a vendor, in this case Honeywell, um, to narrow down a very specific set of rules and build firewalls specifically designed for this. We call these fixed configuration firewalls. They wanted only data to be read from the safety system, in other words, a read-only firewall, and they wanted to check every message that made sure it followed the Modbus specification. And then once that was done, the whole system was locked to these safety system appropriate rules. Nobody could tamper with it. Nobody could change it. It really reduced expenses and, and audits and um, maintenance of the firewalls because they were locked at the factory. Now you'll notice one of the core things about this is to keep the security simple. As a controls engineer, as a controls technician, as a uh, process specialist, your job is basically to do control system work. And, and the people in your plant, they're focusing on making sure that you make product reliably and safely. And so you want to make the whole security process as easy as possible. And, and these quotations from uh, the committee at the ISA 99 from the major end users are, are really clear. And I think this one, the first one, it really counts. Um, it says, certainly controls engineers and operators need to be security aware, but they should not all need to be security experts. And I believe that's really the core of it. You want to use technology and designs that are uh, clear, 
consistent and very simple to use. As soon as you get complexity, you have what we call the enemy of security. Um, and that's not going to serve you well at all. So a few closing thoughts here. Um, first of all, Stuxnet has changed the landscape. The threats are out there. People know that control systems are vulnerable and they are actively attacking them now. Um, and these uh, systems are, well, they're uh, under attack from very sophisticated attacks like Stuxnet, like DoQ. Um, people are actively uh, doing vulnerability discoveries. Um, they're trying to find the holes in your control system. They're scanning them from the internet. They're taking the hardware that you use and subjecting it to very rigorous tests and then publicly announcing these uh, vulnerabilities so bad guys can use them. And so as an industry, we have to accept the fact that we are not going to have perfectly secure control systems and we can't prevent the infection of our control systems completely any more than you can prevent the infection of a human body. Eventually something, a virus, a bacteria gets into the human body and the same thing in a control system. But what we need to do is have this defense in depth strategy that as soon as something gets into your control system, you have a way of quarantining it off, being alerted by, uh, that it's there and doing something about it and not have it run rampant through your whole system. And again, this is what the zones and conduits model uh, that the ISA 99 and IEC 62443 standards uh, are proposing. Build your plant so that you can control worms or viruses or hackers if they manage to get a foothold. Don't let them spread through the entire plant. It's important you start working on this today and waiting for the next worm is just going to be too late because what we saw from Stuxnet is these new worms are very destructive. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about this, um, I have a series of references both from Siemens and papers that I and um, partners have written and you can see them here. Um, feel free to have a look at these papers um, and uh, uh, explore um, all the nuances of Stuxnet and what it means to your control system. We'd like to thank Eric Byers of Byers Security Incorporated for his great presentation. Just a reminder, Eric will be available in our Knowledge Exchange to answer any questions you may have at the conclusion of this presentation. Now before moving on to explore the exhibit hall of this event, please take a moment to click the Take Survey button and let Eric know how he did today. Your feedback helps us improve the quality of our Global Spec events making them an even better investment of your time. In between sessions, head to the exhibit hall where you'll find manufacturer product reps, engineers, technical specialists, and other professionals waiting to answer your questions. Now remember, exhibitor representatives are only here today, so spend time with them while you can. Take advantage of valuable information delivered directly to your inbox. GlobalSpec offers more than 60 online publications filled with the latest advances in your area of expertise and sign up for our e-newsletters and product alerts. You can find both of these links by going to the Resource Center and clicking Resources in the Select Category Filter. Share your thought leadership point of view. You can find the speaker submittal form at our event help desk in the exhibit hall. We'd like to thank you for choosing to spend your day with us, and we'll see you back here in the Conference Center later on.